Book support three for Gothic literature, We Have Always Lived in the Castle, chapters five and six. This is the lovely town that you guys created for me. Thank you, I'm really very happy with it. Some of the presentations were better than others, so as we move forward, we'll, we'll start working on how we do presentations really well, but otherwise, I'm very happy with what I got, so thank you, this is a great town. And it's a really great way for the class to come together as a whole and make something beautiful from the book, which I'm hoping we'll do at the end of this book, because this book is really very visual and fun. And in chapters five and six, we're gonna start seeing that. So let's go right into chapter five. It starts right here on page 85. Um, I'm not going to read parts to you, I just want to go over the book with you. Um, so, Mary Cat ran away last night because Cousin Charles showed up and she had what, what we could loosely translate into an anxiety attack. Uh, she ran out and just like Courtney got us to, she went and slept in some kind of like little foresty knoll where she literally made a bed and she just went, went to sleep with Jonas there. So, we have the reinforcement of the fact that Mary Cat does embody nature so that she can go into nature and find comfort and find some kind of solace or at least the ability to hide in it. So we, we have that. She has security in nature. And, and of course, just like we were talking about, the, the gentleman who sit right here, uh, Dan and Patrick and, and Nick, you know, we were all talking about like, why is she creating this bizarre false sense of security through these items? Well, again, she has taken on the role of the dad and she's going into nature. She's taking little domestic items of power like the book and the doll and silver coins and she's putting them into nature to try and create some kind of at least false illusion of, of uh, safety. Think about that actual gate. It's a wired gate with a little tiny bicycle lock holding it shut. Anybody can break into this house. It's only secure because people are playing by the rules. People decide to stop playing by the rules. This house is not actually safe. Mary Cat knows that. She just, in her strange warped Mary Cat brain, can't really fathom another way to make it more safe. So she's got that issue going on. Okay, let us look right at the book. It's really neat on page 60, 86. She starts talking about, you know, we, we should go on the moon and we'll leave rose petals on the moon. And Constance picks up, some rose petals are poisonous. Not on the moon. Is it true that you can plant leaf, some leaves, furred leaves? You can put them in water and they grow roots and then you plant them and they grow into plants. And that kind of a plant that they were when they started, of course, not just any plant. I'm sorry about that. Good morning, Jonas. Um, this is just her, it, we want to interpret it as Mary Cat being silly, but it's actually Mary Cat being um, very, very interesting and scary. Constance is saying, Constance, who constantly is true, is saying that things grow up to be what they are. And Marquette is saying, well, I'm sorry for that. They, they are supposed to neaten the house today. So they do go through and they neaten the house, but neatening the house has now taken on a new meaning to Mary Cat as opposed to simply just straightening up the house so that they can keep it as an, a, a museum and almost an homage to the people who lived there before. She's now dutifully erasing signs of Cousin Charles trying to like get rid of all of his touches, which is fantastic. I, I really like the idea of that. She goes as far as to like polish the doorknob of, of the father. Cousin Charles comes down for breakfast and he gets pancakes from Constance and um, he makes a big deal about like, oh, these pancakes are so good and he hasn't tried them. Um, and it's, it's neat because it's Constance and Julian and Charles and Mary Cat and Cousin Charles is, you know, talking and, and Uncle Julian starts to talk about, you know, like what had happened and your father and what, what's going on. And Cousin Charles doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to um, interact. Uh, he doesn't want to remember the past, basically, because as we read, his father was actually quite mean to Mary Cat. His father said, like, you don't, you know, we're not going to mention the family in the household, and I'm not going to take in Mary Cat during the trial, because of course this was six years ago. She was 10. Um, and Mary Cat runs away from Charles after he finally eats one of the pancakes, and Constance has to basically guilt him into it, saying, you know, you had dinner here last night, and you woke up alive today. If I was going to kill you, I'd use my hands. I'm going to challenge you. When you guys were saying that he's a ray of hope, I'm going to take you to this lovely little scene. Um, Cousin Charles very rudely cuts off Uncle Julian, saying that I'm not going to discuss it anymore. Now, Uncle Julian is discussing a topic that makes everybody uncomfortable, but for six years straight, he lived in a house with two girls 
who he had no problem discussing what had happened with because he had been permanently disabled because of it. And, and I don't know if you've noticed this at this point, he only talks to Constance. He never actually addresses Mary Cat, and Mary Cat never talks to him either. Um, so, you know, he's not used to someone just saying like, I'm not talking about it. And, and Uncle Julian's actually quite hurt by this. Uh, and by the time dinner comes along, so we have breakfast all the way to dinner, he's actually very rudely saying things like, uh, where is it, where is it, where is it? You know, you always eat with him here? Like I can just see this kind of like, you know, 32 year old schlub like hunking over his, his meal, putting his shepherd's pie that, that lovely Constance made into his mouth, scarfing it down, and with his fork, pointing over at Uncle Julian going, you always let him eat here? It's like, uh, it's his house. Yeah, we always let him eat here. Maybe we shouldn't let you eat here. And um, uh, he, he very, very threateningly says to Mary Cat, here it is on page um, 101, he's talking to Jonas, the cat, and he says, Cousin Mary doesn't like me, Charles said again to Jonas. I wonder if Cousin Mary knows how I get even with people who don't like me. And then we know that there's a, a click that Constance comes in. Can I help you with that chair, Constance? Have a nice nap, Uncle. All of a sudden he's like laying it on extra thick. We, we know people like this guy. We do. You, you know you know people who have been rude to one person and then they're extra nice to that next person just to be like, I'm a sweetheart, not a jerk. This guy's a jerk. And, and we should know by the end of chapter five, he's up, what is all this tape? He's the thunderclap of doom. He is not the ray of hope that we were hoping for. And by, by the end of this, you should also start to pick up on why did this dude all of a sudden decide to come visit? It's been six years and he's like, he's 32 years old. And he's like, oh, I, I thought it was high time I came and visited. And I, I didn't want to do it before my father died because I didn't want to you know, insult him. You're 32, dude, give me a break. Uh, another thing that he does that threatens Maricat is he agrees to start going into the town and doing the shopping for her, which she finds extraordinarily threatening. Um, that's, that's her job, that's her identity, and he's now not only upsetting you know, the status quo of the house, he's now upsetting the status quo of the safety, because if he has to go in and out of that gate, that means he gets to hold a key. So the question I'd like you to consider, and I will expect to see it on Monday, and since I know you all know how to find these because we watched one, how does Cousin Charles threaten Mary Cat? All right, we're in chapter six, starts on page 107. Um, as it says, as we were just talking about, the house was not secure because Charles had gone out of it and into the village for one thing, um, and Constance gave him the key. So now we have somebody who Mary Cat considers unreliable holding the key, and he had gone out, and, and just, you guys are smart, if a door opens so somebody can come out, that means someone can come in. That's, that's how this works. So Mary Cat is very upset and, and very threatened by the introduction of Charles into her house, not just because he stole jobs for her, I don't think she enjoyed going to the village, but because she was aware that this new person meant that there could be interactions. Um, he goes away, and of course, Mary Cat plays a little trick on him, making him forget the library books, uh, so, so it would look like he's inadequate at the job, and then I, I suppose in her head, she figures Constance would fire him, and then he would go away. Um, no. And Constance starts talking about gingerbread, and this is where I, I just start to fall in love with the book, because if there's one thing I love to make, it's gingerbread. Um, it's so yummy. Uh, and, and this book makes me want to bake all the time. Um, uh, Constance then sort of kidnaps the story away from Mary Cat, not being the narrator, but Mary Cat is then forced to hang out with Constance in the kitchen. And we, we the reader, are forced to then also hang out in the kitchen with Constance, who is constantly baking, hence her name is still Constance. Uh, and she says, you know, she wants to make gingerbread, and, and Mary Cat's like, I make gingerbread. And she's like, well, it'll be cool by the time you get home. And Mary Cat's like, mm, you know, who cares? Charles stinks. I'll eat it. And uh, we now start to see a little balance in Constance's power and affection. She wants to make the gingerbread for Charles because he said he liked it, and Mary Cat is not understanding that the world stopped revolving around her and Uncle Julian and the house and Jonas and Constance. We're, we're seeing a balance of power shift in this relationship between Mary Cat and Constance. And I'd like you guys to start thinking about who has power. So in your notes, and I'd like you to make a note, prior to chapter six, who do you think has power? And then after chapter six, 
is the power starting to shift to a different person and how so? Charles comes home and he's holding a watch fob, a, a chain in his in his hand, and he's flipping out. And he's like, this is a gold watch fob. And Constance is like, yeah, good. And he's like, it's smashed. I found it nailed to a tree. And Constance is like, mm -hmm, it's good job. You're going to find all sorts of stuff nailed to the tree out there. Maricat does this all the time. And he's like, but that's expensive. And she's like, okay, keep going. And he's like, we could have sold it. She's like, why would we do that? We don't need money. Go let her nail things to trees. Who cares? So um, Constance is not really understanding. Charles is upset. And I want to see if you guys can make a prediction as to whether she's going to start to see things Charles's way. Uh, and, and also, why is Charles suddenly really interested in the items around the house? So question for right now is, why is Charles here? Merkett says that he makes Uncle Julian sicker. Um, and Constance says, like, oh, no, 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 he's just trying to, you know, make Uncle Julian think about happy things and, and think happy thoughts. I want, I want you guys to challenge Constance and find me examples of him not being nice to Uncle Julian and support Mary Cat. So find me two examples of where Cousin Charles is actually making Uncle Julian sicker. All right, uh, right around 118, Mary Cat makes a big deal about Constance's introduction to a pronoun. Constance, Constance has been using I or you throughout the entire thing, and all of a sudden we get a we. And Mary Cat goes, does we mean you and Charles? And she goes, Mary Cat, which is yes. We have an interesting uh, thing on page 121. Uncle Julian realizes right away that Charles is a bad guy, and he starts to become very worried about this young man rifling through his things. So we, in a way, have kind of a, a, a marry between Mary Cat and Uncle Julian, both having the same fear of Cousin Charles, that he's there to touch things, that he's there to displace things, that he's there to change things. Neither of these two people want them. So it's interesting that Jackson pairs those two together. They sit down and they have a lovely dinner and Constance then goes to, to play the harp. Uh, that's the instrument that she plays. She's very good at it. It's very beautiful to listen to. And she plays a couple of songs. And then Uncle Julian, who rightfully is the man of the house, says, oh, that was very lovely. You know, your mother had a delicate touch. I'd really love you to play this one song. And Cousin Charles shushes him like a dog at his table and goes, no, you, you go off to bed now. And you too, Mary Cat, we have things to discuss. Ah, uh, you back that up, buddy. Where does Charles's authority come from? Is he taking it from Constance, or is she giving it to him? Um, is it something that he he is claiming as his own, or is it an authority that she is endowing into him? Because I want you to really start thinking about the power struggle between Constance and Mary Cat. Um, we can say that they hold each other hostage, but we have to figure out like in what scene who is holding whom hostage. All right? Okay, so I will see you guys on Monday with these written out on a piece of paper and not a post-it note. Thank you. Uh, and I hope you guys have a good weekend. Bye.